Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to go review a few items to kind of focus your study for the uh, for the midterm exam. First off, a couple of quick things. Um, the midterm exam is going to be the week before spring break, and I'll go through the availability for the test and all that kind of stuff. So although I, I think it's fairly clear in the syllabus, so look at that if you're still confused, but uh, the way this works for testing is... For the midterm, you just go on Blackboard anytime during the open period and you take the exam. That's that's it. No no big deal. Just just take the test on your own. No RP now. None of that. Um, there's in terms of notes and things like that. Um, well, you'll probably crash the program if you try and do it on your own computer because the Blackboard testing is kind of finicky like that. So I would not be messing with um, doing that. And then open book kind of stuff. No, it's not open book. And the way that that's kind of enforced on the on the midterm is just the, you know, there's going to be too many questions. If you're trying to look things up, uh, you're not going to finish. The test is going to close out and, and that's not going to be a good strategy. So anyway, it's uh, it's closed book for for the uh, for the midterm now the, you know you shouldn't have a huge difficulty with this exam if you you know review this tape and and uh, or whatever uh, video and uh, you know are kind of up to speed on the on the material that's covered because once we get into it I'm going to go through the questions and um, you know talk about each subject and we'll try and you know refine it down distill it down to the important bits rather than just kind of a shotgun approach because a lot of times you know get off on other tangents and uh, there's kind of a, a minimum standard or you know important relevant things that that I try to focus the test on so um, I'm looking at your syllabus right here the uh, you know the midterm exam on here is labeled 2 March which is within that window but that's just the day that that week in there um and then you're going to be off on spring break the the following week um in the test options thing let me see exactly what i've got um because i can you know uh, set the time that this window is basically going to be open where you're going to see it visible on on a blackboard and so what i've got set up is uh the 29th february 29th through um march uh, 7th closing out march 7th at 5 p.m so you know again don't wait till the last minute but if you are going to wait the last minute yeah 5 p.m is it and then it just closes so uh, that's not a good situation um uh, Okay, and I'm going to start talking about the exam here in, in just a second. Let me get back to that page. Um, like I say, it should be pretty straightforward. There's some topics that, you know, if you hear me refer to them a couple times, um, you know, that can be work out in your favor if, if you actually uh, know that topic. It's more prevalent on the final because there's more questions. But anyway, if there is some redundancy or, or you know, some ability for one question to kind of answer another question, kind of take advantage of that. But we're just going to cover some some basic topics. It's going to be multiple choice. Again, it's going to be on Blackboard. Um, you could have a calculator handy, but again, I think most of the stuff you'll be able to, to do in your head, and you're certainly not going to need any formulas or, or charts or things. You'll, and you'll see, you'll have a pretty good idea of the exam by the time we get this going. So when we're talking about a deductible, what are we talking about? So let's say you get in an accident or something. What is the deductible, right? That's the amount that the insurance company doesn't pay. So if, if for example, um, you know, you have a $500 deductible on an auto policy, um, you know, and you hit something, um, that's, well, uh, this is assuming that you have collision. Collision would, would cover your you know, your own liability. But let's say you hit somebody else and there's a $500 deductible. That means you know, $500 is out of pocket from you. You have to pay before the insurance company uh, pays anything whatsoever, okay? Now, there's good ideas or once you get maybe some, you know, financial means where you can kind of have an emergency fund and kind of have some wherewithal, you definitely might want to consider, um, you know, upping your deductible a bit to, to lower your rates. And, you know, I've had $1,000 deductibles and, um, you know, it, it did lower the rate quite a bit, 
But again, you know, know what you're getting yourself into. If you can't house and handle a thousand dollar charge, then you know, have a lower deductible. But be willing to pay more as you go. Um, what's the disadvantage of using credit as a source of liquidity? Um, you know, as I've mentioned, a lot of times having a, a credit card with an open balance is is quite useful for an emergency fund. Um, but you probably also want to have some money, um, maybe in a brokerage account or money some somewhere available so that you can pay off that uh, credit card before it goes into, you know, it's normal accounting uh, type thing. Once it, once it, if you don't pay off the balance in full uh, by the end of that due date, they're going to start accruing finance charges and finance charges and, you know, using credit cards as a method of, of loaning. Uh, that's just, you know, we're talking uh, finance rates, certainly above 10% and a lot of times into the 20s. And so the uh, disadvantage of using credit as an emergency fund or as a source of liquidity is are those finance charges that you want to make sure you don't uh, accrue. Um, so again, you know, these questions are not that not that difficult, fairly straightforward. If somebody says, you know, what's an APR? APRs are useful, right? APR is the annual percentage rate. And so that is because sometimes there will be some, you know, marketing type things involved and some teaser rates and some other stuff involved. And, and uh, somewhere in that financial disclosure that they send you when you actually sign up for a new credit card, or you sign up for a mortgage, you sign up for any anything like that, there's going to be some boldface type in there that's going to have the uh, uh, letters APR on it. And, and you need to know that's an annual percentage rate. And when you're comparing loans, one loan to another, you do that via the uh, annual percentage rate is the most critical number in there. Uh, I talked about co-signing loans. Co-signing loans are probably not a good idea. I mean, really, you should uh, try to um, avoid it because what can happen, you know, are, are you, well, you you have the same liability for that loan that the originator does. The person who goes in there, tries to get the loan, gets denied. They say, nope, you're not going to get this loan uh, you're going to have to find somebody else to sign on it with you. Somebody else who's going to, you know, uh, share in that liability for the loan. And like I say, if this thing goes to collection, if that person flakes out on it, you know, or just can't pay, uh, the collection agency is not going to mess with that person. That collection agency is going to go to the cosigner. That's, you know, time's money. They're going to they're going to go to you because you have the means you got approved for the loan and guess what you have the same degree of liability for that loan so uh that's more of a true or false or not true or false but there's some uh, answers in there that talk about you having less of a liability and that's not the case um valid reasons for uh you know taking out money for borrowing funds you know and there are some you know college emer or college education medical emergencies things like that um, but if you're actually borrowing money for day-to-day -day living expenses you know not for some unusual circumstance if you're having to now granted I put like I say everything on a credit card groceries and everything else but it's not because I can't pay for it but it's because you know I prefer to pay for it once a month and I prefer to get whatever perks are available but if you're using a credit card because you flat don't have the money and you're not going to pay that bill off at the end of the month well you know the wheels are going to come off the bus shortly you're going to you're going to be in a financial ruins shortly so anyway but for for other things especially real estate as i said if you're not borrowing money in real estate um you're not going to get ahead. You, you you can't do it. You need, you know, your money to be working much harder than you are. And at some point in your life, hopefully you're going to have a nest egg that's earning more money than you could, you could do in a salary. And that's achievable. You don't have to be some, you know, billionaire to have that happen. So anyway, good luck with that. Um, arrangement that protects a customer who writes a check you know for overdraft protection is what we're talking about there so you know kind of know the term and and definitely if you 
have a checking account and you realize you don't have overdraft protection, that's something that you need to to acquire. Um, you may not be able to get it because a lot of times it requires a credit card. But uh, to to you know have a checking account and and you know especially if you're using a debit card or something else that may cause some balance fluctuations and not to have a overdraft protection is is you know pretty dangerous because whatever it overdrafts happen to to everybody at some point and uh, they get super expensive rather than just a you know oh yeah I guess I screwed that one up and especially if you know again I'm not an advocate of having thousands upon thousands in a checking account because it's you're inviting bad things to happen you know in terms of identity theft in terms of you know kind of being disciplined with your spending and the rest of it but if you're going to kind of max perform your checking account you need to have overdraft protection and again that's why you know was in that uh, whatever chapter four thing where they talk about interest on checking accounts I, I I'm just not really bothered by you know whatever interest rate they're gonna give me because I'm not gonna it's 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 gonna be a ridiculously low interest rate and uh, especially with the you know investment environment we're currently in let's hope it lasts but to to have any money kind of sitting around idle is is not smart um, collateral so the concept of collateral is is what makes a loan uh, affordable you know there's some security for the lender right so you have secured loans and unsecured loans secured loans they have that security is that collateral so when you take a car loan and you get a good rate on it the reason you got that good rate is because they can come grab that car you know with the the laws are written as such for the for the repo and you don't you don't have a big say about it you don't make the payments they come get the car which is good because that means that you know they have some protection and they can they can you know give you a, a low interest rate and still still make money I mean you want um, the loan uh, process to be inexpensive for the lender so that they don't charge you you know the the lender's still gonna make money if they can make um, their money um, and still give you a low interest rate that's that's how it works that's how you want it to work uh, let's see comprehensive coverage so I kind of alluded this before we have different coverage you know th there's a legal requirement for liability right that means you run into somebody else you pay to fix their car the the law is you know now whether they're enforced that closely yeah anyway um, but that that is a legal responsibility on your part to have liability to protect the other guy but you yourself nope you know they don't care you can have a huge loan on your car now your lender is going to be very you know very upset with you if you crash that car with no insurance on it you know they're going to expect their money from you and and that you know if you cause the crash and and you're talking about getting your car fixed what we're talking about there is collision right so we had liability we had collision collision takes care of of your car liability takes care of the other guy's car and then the catch-all is comprehensive and comprehensive is you know something like a windshield or hail or things like that that are kind of the cats and dogs kind of stuff be careful with stuff though you know I've had vehicles where I thought oh I'm protected one time I had really nice wheels I was going overseas to Europe for whatever about nine months ended up being about nine years but anyway by the time I got back that the car had been completely vandalized and the nice wheels that oh by the way got stolen they weren't attached to the vehicle they were inside the vehicle because I didn't want them to get all dry rotted anyway since they weren't attached they weren't covered and I got nothing it was just horrible anyway um, stereos you'll find minimal coverage on that you know there's usually some sort of provision where they don't have to fix the car stereo they don't have to fix this and oh by the way if you do report a bunch of little stuff you know they're gonna raise your rates so that kind of kind of come full circle back to the higher deductible um, you know if I have a thousand dollar deductible and it never bother them then anyway it's talk to your agent if you even have a personal you know relationship with them but um, most of the time you know that if they're honest they'll be up front with you and they'll say yeah if you report this we'll give you a little bit of money but guess what we're gonna raise your rates so 
I'd rather have a higher deductible and um, suck it up. But anyway, that's that's something you'll figure out as you go through life and decide how you want to do that. Um, what else? So we talked comprehensive. We talked about a little bit about finance charges on credit cards and what do they apply to. So let's say I ring up my credit card to ten thousand bucks, right? But I pay it all off in that month. Uh, I pay nothing for interest, right? Because I paid it off before that, uh, during the current billing period. So, you know, I do this with equipment. They they now charge me a convenience fee, so I don't use a credit card anymore. But I used to routinely spend, you know, 30 grand a month on, on equipment and trucking and put it all on the card and uh, never pay a dime in interest because, you know, I had the money on hand and I would put it on the card to get the perks and then pay it all off in a month. And it was just easy. But anyway, um, a lot of merchants now will charge a convenience fee that it's don't don't if there's a convenience fee involved, it's it's not going to be worth it, regardless of the miles and the rest of it. So anyway, again, those are personal decisions you'll have to make. But uh, if you're paying that three percent convenience fee, uh, you're not getting enough miles to make it worth it generally. All right. Um, how do banks make money? Well, this is kind of easy. You know, they loan out the money at a higher rate uh, than they than they give it. So if you deposit, say, 10,000 bucks and they're giving you 1% interest, well, uh, you know, their business model is they're loaning that money back out at, say, 8% or something like that. And again, it is, there, there's a certain amount of money they expect to make on their money, and that, that interest rate goes up based upon also the risk. If they're loaning out that money and there's a, a chance it's not going to be paid back because it's an unsecured loan or you know something like that, yeah, then they, they need to make a little bit more money on that. But anyway, the basic business model is that they, uh, uh, they loan out funds um, at a higher rate than they pay their depositors. Okay. Uh, quick access to funds. So that's again, liquidity. Now, liquidity doesn't really speak to the wisdom. You know, you can, you can have a ton of money in the stock market and it's pretty damn liquid. You can get that money back in a couple, three days, which is all artificial anyway. It should be instantaneous like Bitcoin or something else. And so maybe in the next, you know, 10 years or so, it'll drive to that. But, but anyway, money in the stock market is, is liquid. It's, you know, you can convert it back into cash. But if the stock market's, you know, super volatile and all of a sudden it drops, um, yeah, you may not want to, you know, have that as your emergency fund. You may want to have some money in cash that has a constant value rather than a, um, you know, security, some sort of stock or something that's that's volatile. So uh, they're, they're both almost equal in terms of liquidity. But uh, they're not at all equal in terms of uh, desirability to to sell on short notice. Um, again, basic budgeting thing. You know, if you're spending, it exceeds the amount you 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 make. You know, if you're if you're spending more than you have, obviously, you know, you need to reduce your spending. So you can do some second, you know, other things. You know, get a second job, increase your work hours. Yeah, but that's that's again a recipe for disaster. You need to, you know, uh, over the long term. Again, there's going to be you know kind of burbles that are going to happen in your life. But but if you can learn to live within a budget, and you know do some of the techniques like paying yourself first and the rest of that. Um, but if you're continually not able to pay your bills at the end of the month, um, you got to find some way to to cut some things out. Unfortunately, um, in terms of reviewing credit cards, like I say, their propensity to to be nice and cooperative uh, is you know proportional to the uh, the time that you've allowed to elapse. So, if it's within days, uh, they're they're your best friend because they haven't even paid the vendor yet, and they'll just put a stop payment, and and um, that vendor will you know never get the settlement from the credit card company if they already paid pardon me paid the money to that you know vendor yeah now they're going to have to retrieve it they're going to be a little less and then if you let it go over 30 days you got an issue um and you 
do have an issue because their legal requirement is is now um, elapsed as well. So, um, but anyway, things you want to do when you're reviewing that number one, make sure that the charges are indeed yours, and and you'll see this. You know, you'll you'll get some. Typically, the the first warning you'll get, and this again has. Uh, you know, it's a good thing about having a good credit score. If, if all of a sudden you're being denied credit or all of a sudden your credit card's not working for some reason, yeah, that's probably because somebody rang it up. Or credit cards, too, as a defensive, you know, measure. If they see a bunch of charges in a strange place, will um, typically put a hold on that card. So, you know, if you are somebody who's going to be doing a lot of kind of chaotic travel that you know looks chaotic from somebody watching the screen wherever back in in um, wherever the credit card people are located um, you might want to call that credit card company and say I'm going to uh, be doing some travel I've noticed the credit card companies now they want you to activate a GPS so they can you know verify your phone and your credit card are kind of the same place but I don't need that kind of monitoring but um, if you do say go on, you know, I've had this happen where I picked up a truck in, you know, Dallas and we drove to Utah and then up to Montana and we, we were making good time and finally the credit card, you know, just said whatever, it quit working and, and I got a text message and you'll find that pretty, pretty commonly. So uh, you, you can alleviate that by uh, letting them know in advance that you're traveling or if, if that sort of happens to you, check and you probably have a text message uh, whether, you know, those charges are valid. So, again, they know that they're going to be on the hook legally uh, for some of those overcharges. And uh, they want to stop the fraud as, as you know, badly as, as you do. They'll act like they're, you know, they're out to, to save you and, you know, prevent the theft. But um, if, if you report it to them in a timely manner they're going to be the ones on the hook. So especially depending on, you know, as I do take credit cards for some of the business stuff I do, uh, that's why you'll see people use the, the chip typically. If they're just using a, a swipe now, like on Square or something like that, um, and there is any fraud, uh, the retailer uh, doesn't get reimbursed. At least that's a policy of Square right now. And uh, anyway, but if I use the chip method, then Square will cover it. So anyway, things will change. We'll talk more about credit card in the upcoming uh, lectures. Okay, here's a uh, stock purchase. We haven't talked too much about this yet, but uh, I did talk about um, short-term, long-term, right, in terms of, of personal finance, and the definition really flows from, from the IRS. And so if it's over a year, it's long-term. If it's under a year, it's short-term. You know, I had a friend who sold some stock and he sold it after three months. So what's going to happen is that's considered short term. Right. And that tax rate he's going to pay is probably going to be around 30 percent. If he would have kept it a year, it would have been considered long term and he would have paid 15 percent. So it, it does make a huge difference. Anyway, in this example, it's just a simple thing. Lady keeps some stock for a certain length of time, you know, and that time is. Is it's either longer than a year or shorter than a year, and and uh, you're just talking about what her capital gain is, and the capital gain is the difference between what you paid for it and what you sold it for. Um, the concept that uh, money received today is worth much more than money received in the future. That's true because of compound interest. Right. And compound interest, what the, the compound part of it means that you're earning interest on interest. So simple interest is the opposite of that. Simple interest means, you know, I have 100 bucks and I get 8 percent simple interest on it. So at the end of the year, I have 108 bucks. Right. If it's compound interest, I'm going to have maybe 110, 111 bucks, something like that, because, uh, you know, on day one or day two, you know, I've got that one 365th of that eight percent and you know so now i'm earning interest on you know a hundred dollars and and a few cents and then by the end of the year i'm earning interest on you know a hundred and ten dollars and so anyway it, it does make a difference compound interest now it's you know over the course of a year yeah no big but over the course of 40 years and that's the kind of time you have to play with if you're you know younger 
um, it's going to be a huge difference. And that's when I talked about your your money working harder than than you do and your money hopefully out earning you by the end of your career. The reason that's going to be possible is because of compound interest. So hopefully you'll be in that position. Um, we talked about mortgage rates, right? So fixed mortgage is the typical thing. It's the safest thing. There's more aggressive kind of strategies like variable rate mortgage that are indexed to inflation and they're, they can go up a little bit. And, you know, people were, were all excited about this years ago and they were semi-common when people were very speculative and, and thought that real estate can never go down. And anyway, um, I'm not going to lie, I've had some variable mortgages, but there, there's always kind of a... Uh, you know, you're kind of laying it out there a little bit because if, if uh, a lot of times people will take a variable rate mortgage, an APR, adjustable rate mortgage, more, more accurately, is because maybe they can't quite afford uh, the higher rate of the fixed rate. The fixed rate is typically going to be higher. And so if you're in that sort of situation and interest rates start to go up, now all of a sudden your your variable or your adjustable rate is higher than the fixed rate um, yeah you kind of lost that bet so anyway uh, the good thing about a fixed rate mortgage though that payment on day one is the same on you know the 30th year if it's a 30-year mortgage now within that payment let's say it's a fourteen hundred dollar payment you know that first year yeah the uh, the interest being paid is probably thirteen hundred dollars and the principal being paid is probably one hundred dollars and by the end of you know in the thirtieth year the payment is still fourteen hundred bucks but now you know thirteen hundred of it is going to principal which is that you know say three hundred grand you owed and only a hundred bucks is being spent on interest because there's not that much in the in the item okay uh what else Sorry for the background noises here. Uh, homeowners associations. We all probably have pretty strong opinions on them. If you've never had a home um, and somebody says, oh, you absolutely want one or you absolutely don't want one. Um, yeah, they're, they're not giving you the full story. Sometimes they work out great. Sometimes they don't. Uh, one disadvantage could be you know, the covenants, so restrictive covenants can, uh, yeah, let's say you want to paint your house, uh, you know, a certain color of blue or something like that, that it doesn't even have to be anything too off the wall. You may find out that, oh, no, you needed to get that approved. And that happens in neighborhoods up here, you know. Um, it, it's, it, it can happen, and especially if you live in a um, perhaps some sort of um, – uh, neighborhood that's got some historical significance to it. I've got friends in the UK. Oh man, he had a, a house with a thatch roof and did not realize what the maintenance is. <laughs> and, and you know, and again, we we kind of live in a uh, a good uh, situation in Europe. A lot of times, you you don't have options anyway because of his situation. He uh, he had to. He could not change that roof out. He couldn't do anything. He just had to pay somebody to to do it. And you know, again, I have another friend in France, where uh, you know, over here in the states, you go, oh, yeah, I, I think I'm just going to paint it myself. Oh no, uh, no. In France, you got to hire a painter. You're not going to uh, put the painters out of out of work. So anyway, different different policies, different politics. But we you can have those kind of variations even here in the states. So. Um, anyway, the question was about neighborhood, um, you know, homeowners associations, and they can be good or bad. You know, it will prevent the person, you know, next door, your next door neighbor painting their house, you know, fluorescent yellow. So that's good. But, you know, if, if they want to come by and tell you you can't have a trailer in your yard or something like that, um, that's bad. So. Uh, look at what you're signing up for. Those will all be presented to you when you're when you're buying the property. All right, opportunity cost. We hit this fairly hard. Um, opportunity cost, a big concept, goes with you know goes along with everything, especially in personal finance. But um, if if you do one thing, you can't be doing the other. You know, if you're watching TV, you're not going to the gym. If you're buying a brand new car, you're probably not traveling the world. You know, so. 
your your money is all going to probably be spent or invested at the you know at the end of the check and uh what are you going to do with it there's there's always going to be trade-offs and those those trade-offs are are opportunity costs um purchasing items on on credit um there used to be a concept where any kind of consumer debt you know credit card interest was was high but at least you could deduct it on your taxes and that changed probably going on 20 years now where consumer debt is no longer deductible other than um things home equity loans so you know if you're um have a certain amount of money and or need a certain amount of money you need to take a loan um you might uh, look to the home equity loan to to get that money now theoretically that money's supposed to be spent on you know the home and not like say on a boat or a snow machine or something like that but you know it's all one big pot of money as long as you have expenses related to your home uh you know that that exceed the amount of that loan and oh guess what it freed up a bunch of money that you're going to use for some consumer debt um anyway you, you there's ways you can you can work that out but anyway um uh home equity loans are just like home mortgage loans where that interest is deductible within certain limits um retirement plans retirement planning should begin as soon as possible right so you know as soon as possible so that you can uh, get sufficient money for retirement so this is where things like student loans or or maybe opportunity costs such as you know uh you know having a, a different car I, I i know i sound like mr anti-car person here but believe me uh, outside of divorce cars are probably the the worst financial decision people people make and uh if you can go easy on that and start putting some money uh, uh, away for retirement, even if it seems like a small amount, uh, it will make a huge, huge difference uh, because of the compound interest again. Since health insurance is ex it's expensive, um, employers uh, typically cover. Um, you know, you sh usually have uh, something with your with your employer where it's subsidized. So. You know things like well, we call it the Affordable Care Act, we call it Obamacare, we call we call it what you like, but it doesn't affect the uh, vast majority of people, you know, citizens out there, because most people have some sort of insurance that is provided by their employer, and it's done at a, at a group rate, and it's usually you know fairly fairly reasonable. Um, so. And then you also have, you know, we talk about people who don't have insurance. There's some people who don't have insurance because they can't afford it, but there's also some people who don't have insurance because they can't afford it. There's there's some people who, you know, and I'm not saying the the top people, let's just say the the one percenters, for example, they're probably better off being self insured. Uh, because if you go to a hospital and you're sick and you you know, there's a procedure that's ten thousand bucks and if you're a, a cash um, payer, and we'll, we'll talk more about this in health insurance, you know, the, the rate that you would actually have to pay uh, could sometimes be quite a bit less because, you know, if, if say it's you know, negotiated down to 2,500 bucks, they're gonna get all that 2,500 bucks, whereas sometimes hospital bills are inflated because, you know, Medicare, Medicaid may only pay at a 50% rate or whatever. Anyway, the, there's there's probably an expert out there in healthcare who's you know pulling their hair out right now, but but that is a, a truism that is you know constantly changing. The numbers are going to be changing, but the the truth is though that that um, if you identify yourself as a cash payer and are self-insured, um, healthcare may make more sense to to be. Uh, self-insured um next one stopping payment on a check so this concept it's it's not used that often because checks aren't used that often and also because checks are typically electronically processed now so that means that 
Uh, if you try to do a stop payment on a check that's already been electronically processed, it's too late. The check um, cannot have cleared in order for you to, to do a stop payment. Student loans, um, car loans, housing are examples of long-term liabilities, right? Student loans, car loans, all those housing loans especially, they're all greater than one year. They're certainly not an asset, and so that would make them a long-term liability. You have liabilities, you have assets, right? It's a something you owe, so it's a liability. It's greater than a year, so it's a long-term liability. Best measure of a person's wealth is their net worth, right? So you get the assets minus the liabilities. So let's say you're living in a million dollar home. You're not necessarily a millionaire if you've got a you know nine hundred thousand mortgage on that. No, you're you got a hundred thousand bucks of equity and minus whatever liabilities you have. So I'm not saying not to take out that loan, but don't don't think you're a millionaire um, because uh, you don't actually have a million in assets. You have a lot of liability and a hundred thousand in, in assets. Uh, best way to uh, reduce your homeowner's insurance premium and is increase the deductible. So again, you know, I had some not major earthquake damage, but you know, four or five grand. Did I get a dime out of it? No. I talked to my agent. She said, "Yep, you can do that. You know, some flooring damage, but you know, <laughs> number one, you got a thousand dollar deductible, and you know, we'll give you that other money, but we'll get it back from you by." increasing your rates and you know she wasn't singling me out it's just the it's the way the insurance companies work you know you report a lot of claims your rates go up so again it's you know for me insurance is just for almost catastrophic type things because the the reporting the small stuff always seems to to backfire um anyway you'll you'll all have your own experiences there um Another uh, kind of repetitive question here, earning interest on interest over time is called compounding, right? So we talked about this. Compounding is that, that you know, completely different than simple interest. You're earning interest on interest. ARM, which I was calling, a, I think I refer to it as a variable rate mortgage. Again, you're going to see terms kind of used interchangeably, but by far the industry standard for that kind of loan is called an ARM an adjustable rate mortgage and that's the type that you know it's the ones I had in Europe were indexed to the LIBOR the London interbank something rate here in the States it'll be indexed to some you know financial measure and then there'll be a provision within the loan you know and you're gonna read all this paperwork or at least you should and it'll say you know under the terms of this loan we can increase the rate by say one percent per year based upon this other measure so it's not going to go from a you know a two percent loan to a ten percent loan in a year but if if rates start going up um it, it will certainly start to creep up and and the rationale right now you know the interest rate environment we're in right now interest rates are quite low and if you can lock in a, a fixed rate mortgage at, you know, three and a half percent, whatever, talk to your mortgage banker. But you're this is this is a good time to be locking in that low fixed rate that people, you know, have dreamed about in in previous economic times. So that's why you're not super popular right now. And if you've got a good, you know, real estate, not real estate, but a mortgage broker, he will point that out to you. You know, online, you might find some teaser rates where they're saying, oh, yeah, we can get you a 2%. Well, if they had your best interest at heart, they would probably say, although we can get you 2%, you're probably better off locking in this 3% because, um, you know, economies are kind of cyclical. And right now we're in a pretty good cycle and take full advantage of it. Time value of money implies that a dollar received today is worth more than a dollar received tomorrow. So if you know nothing about compound interest, this just exam is going to just beat you up. Um, anyway, if you do, you'll have about five questions uh, that are going to be, you know, kind of repetitive. Uh, we haven't talked too much about 
some of this insurance stuff because we're going to be talking about insurance in the next week or so. But um, if you've got a homeowner's policy, for example, and you've got, let's say, a bunch of photography equipment and you're like, wow, I'm getting this insurance for, you know, just a hundred bucks a year and, and they're insuring, you know, my $10,000 worth of photography equipment. This is a great deal. It's not a great deal. What's going to happen is if you look carefully in that policy that's pretty inexpensive, there will probably be special uh, caveats in there that we will insure, you know, any category of items uh, uh, within a limit of, say, a thousand bucks or something like that. You'll see it on jewelry. You'll see it on photography equipment. You'll see it perhaps on guns or other things. And so if you have those items and you want to make sure you are protected, then you need to get uh, typically it's called a rider or a personal you know floater but it's an addendum it's a an extra thing uh, that's added to the contract that actually delineates those items so you know if you for whatever reason have some you know diamond or extensive gun collection or something like that you don't want to keep any secrets from the insurance people or else you will find out that yeah it's probably wasn't covered so make sure that that's that's you know taken care of and that you you do have that coverage you're thinking about also uh, related to this is make sure typically that you have replacement cost you know you may think you have a thousand dollar tv set but if you don't have replacement costs they can say oh yeah because it's two years old and because it's you know the technology's changed we're going to give you 200 bucks for that TV and you can't replace it for that so that's a bit of a problem so again talk to your your agent or consult you know look at the policy to make sure that uh, there's a replacement cost unless you're willing to accept that I mean replacement cost is gonna be more expensive but you know um, just go into it with with full knowledge of what you're doing had a household remember we we're talking about taxes a little bit I talked about um, you know the different uh filing statuses single married married filing um you know jointly or or uh filing separately anyway and then there's another caveat there head of household and so head of household to to get that done obviously you're going to be single because you have those other categories the married categories which you know to be head of household you have to be single or else you'd be in the married category and then also you have to have somebody, uh, you know, one dependent. And again, you know, there's parameters on dependents and, you know, based upon age. And it could even be a, a, an older person, but you need to, you know, comply with the IRS provisions on that for what qualifies for a dependent. And obviously only one, you know, if you're single with children and there's a, uh, you know, spouse out there in some sort of custody arrangement only one of you is going to be able to claim that that um, dependent purchasing a home who pays the real estate commission the seller so if you're a buyer it's a kind of a no-brainer um, you know there might be reason you don't want to use an agent but to tell you the truth I can't really think of any because you know uh, anyway um, for the most part um, if you're selling a home, maybe it's a consideration, but again, we'll talk more about real estate, but I'd say in most cases, um, you know, paying the commission a lot of times is, 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 uh, worth it. But, um, again, that's a, that's a judgment call on the buying end. If you're buying a home, since you're not paying the commission, yeah, that's probably a good reason to use one. Um, Another one about credit cards, paying off the balance. It's wise to do that to uh, prevent any charges from accruing. Uh, another question about, uh, you know, what's going to have a lower interest rate, an unsecured or secured loan. Obviously, the uh, <clears throat> secured one, cash advance, that's going to have an interest rate that starts on the day that money's taken out. If you use your credit card like an ATM, that will... Uh, They'll charge you a fee typically, and then they'll charge you interest from that day forward. Vacation loan, again, vacation loan's not secured by an asset, so that's going to be a higher interest rate. <coughs> okay, pardon me. Which of the following is a liquid asset? So, 
the big caveat to know about liquid assets, the, the one that is definitely never a liquid asset is real estate. Real estate transactions take a while. People can back out with, and you have very little recourse. It's just not liquid. If you need the money now, selling a piece of property and expecting to get that money within, you know, six weeks is, is pretty optimistic. Uh, unless you're willing to really sell it for a, a bargain and, and then that's not wise either. What's your following is an opportunity cost. So again, um, another opportunity cost question. And, you know, opportunity cost involves a trade-off. If you're buying one thing and not buying another, that that's where the opportunity cost comes in there. Standard homeowner's policy. So another insurance question. Um, this is kind of a particular one we haven't talked about much yet, but um, the, the concept of insurance in general, we'll spend a little bit of time discussing that, but insurance business is is done on the proposition that insurance companies can, can stay in business and remain solvent and pay their bills based upon the fact that not, you know, everybody is going to have bad luck on the same day. So they can, they can you know, insure automobiles or homes against fire or some sort of damage um, and and that's a viable business model meaning that they're not going to just take people's money and then go out of business and not pay anybody off um, you know in most circumstances what is a problem for insurance companies are floods right floods tend to affect a wide swath of people all at once so for an insurance company, private insurance company to offer flood insurance would be a poor practice because they would sure enough take your money every month. And then when the flood happens, they file bankruptcy and, and basically walk away and the government gets stuck with a bill. So the government does not allow um, flood, private flood insurance policy. Any flood insurance you have is under the federal program because the federal government, you know, has the resources to to cover that. Uh, so it'll be managed oftentimes by you know private companies, but uh, there's very strict limits. I I had to have flood insurance on my property for a little while until it was the flood zone changed, but it's it's expensive. I mean, we're talking maybe four grand a year, something like that depending on the nature of the, the flood hazard and the rest of it. So it's it'll add hundreds, you know, onto your mortgage. So uh, you definitely want to check into that. And, uh, you know, but at least you can get insurance. Now, there's other homes, too. And this is where me talking about maybe you want to use a real estate agent when you're buying a home. You can go and buy, um, especially if you're paying cash, you can buy a house, especially here in Alaska, that's in an avalanche zone. Uh, that's in has some sort of major defect to it, and uh, now most lenders they won't loan on that home. But if you got cash and you're stupid enough to part with it, uh, you can legitimately buy that home. Um, and the whole disclosure bit did the did the seller tell you all the defects? Eh, if, if there's not an agent involved, now you're kind of suing, you know, this other individual. If there's an agent involved. Uh, he's not going to let that happen because he and the broker are on the hook. They do not want, they're going to lose in court. You as the buyer um, are in a pretty strong position to say, hey, look, this was a real estate professional who's involved in this, and I feel as I've been duped. You know, and, and the court will generally side with you. So you have a little bit more protection in, in that regard. But, you know, for sale by owner kind of stuff, oof, a lot of times it ends up being a mess, and a lot of times it doesn't even end up being discovered until you know a, another transaction so anyway getting along here we'll keep pushing on uh cash advances on credit cards yep you will pay they're not treated just like other transactions uh statements bank credit cards visa um yep using it for emergency funds is is valid as long as you have enough to pay off that balance when it comes to um Important to monitor your debt level, yeah, cause so you can, you know, live within your means. So that's the important thing. You know, some of these arbitrary numbers, liquidity ratios, all that other stuff, that's that's all nice. But the main thing is that, you know, you can cover your monthly payments. 
Um, we talk about insurance, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but there's um, different insurance, you know, strategies. You know, what I was talking about before being self-insured perhaps, you know, and, and if you don't have collision, you're, you're essentially self-insured for, for the amount of damage to your car. Um, that's a, a, you know, a, a way of uh, managing risk. Um, you can also avoid risk or you can try to, but that's not realistic unless you're going to, you know, walk. Uh, if you're at all driving, you, you can't really avoid uh, risk. Um, now you can insure against risk, that's valid, but um, ignoring risks is is not valid. To pretend like nothing's going to happen and have no, you know, no cognizance uh, is is not a valid strategy. So, kind of a strange question, but uh, that's the the gist of it. All right, so we went on about 50 minutes, but uh, if you you know listen to this, uh, you'll you'll do well on the exam. Good luck. Um, like I say, you'll you'll see it there on Blackboard. You don't have to do anything special. When the windows open, uh, you'll take it during that week. I'll put out an announcement later on, but you'll also see it just open there and and take it within that window at any time. And again, by the time the final rolls around, that's where the RP Now procedures take place. But there is no RP Now. There is no e-learning involvement for the midterm. Good luck.